Great. So welcome everyone uh, to the next Division of Psychiatry special lecture. I'm delighted to welcome uh, in our afternoon, but Michael's morning, uh, Michael McCarthy from the University of California at San Diego. Uh, Michael is an Associate Professor of Psychiatry at UCSD and of course a clinical psychiatrist and also a cell biologist, uh, as well as being a circadian scientist. So uh, I'm really excited to hear his talk today, um, which I think is probably on one of the biggest and most interesting and as yet unanswered questions in psychiatry, perhaps, which is how on earth does lithium actually work and how can we use new knowledge about how lithium works to improve outcomes for patients with bipolar disorder. So um, you'll see there's a Q&A section at the bottom. Please type in questions into the Q&A and we'll get to them at the end. Michael's going to speak probably for about 45 minutes. Uh, try not to use the chat function if you can, because it's a little bit distracting, but do place questions in the Q&A and we'll get to it. So without further ado, Michael, you're very welcome. And thanks very much for delivering today's lecture. Over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Danny, for, for inviting me. And it's really a pleasure to be with you in, in uh, Edinburgh today. What, what, a, what a marvel of technology that we can be doing this. This is really great. So the, the title of my talk today is Circadian Rhythms in uh, Bipolar Disorder Patient-Derived Neurons in the Molecular Mechanisms of Lithium Response. Let me see if I can get going here. All right, and so just a quick overview from high altitude. So I'll, I'll give you kind of a brief introduction to circadian rhythms. We'll talk a little bit about bipolar disorder and some of the clinical aspects of it that are important for the work. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the phenotypic heterogeneity that poses such a problem for bipolar disorder research and how drug response and differential response to treatments may be one way of parsing some of this heterogeneity. And then I'll spend most of the time telling you about some of the cellular mechanisms of lithium response. And of course, you know, the overview, this is, this is where I'm coming from today. This is the Pacific Ocean and the UCSD campus. It's a, a great place to come and visit if you ever want to come out. We have a nice circadian rhythms symposium coming up in February. So anyone who's interested in coming would be welcome to come. So just a little bit about uh, why do we have circadian rhythms? So the rotation of the earth on its axis causes this very reliable change in the light dark cycle. And this affects environments for life, especially if you kind of think of this from early life development, single celled organisms that were relying on things like photosynthesis or, or DNA replication that may be very sensitive to UV light and these kinds of things. This was a very strong force on evolution throughout the history of the world. And it caused this the predictability of this 24 hour light cycle caused some um, pressure for biological adaptation that, that I like to think of in terms of a specialized adaptation of the stress response. So, you know, we think of stress as fight or flight, but this is fight, flight, or adapt. So, so organisms that can anticipate these changes in light and dark had a biological advantage uh, throughout the course of evolution. And so we think of this these changes in response to light in, in broad terms as chronobiology. And chronobiology can mean a number of different things. We have ultradian rhythms that are, for example, like the 90 minute cycles that we see in sleep. We have uh, 28 day cycles around the ovulatory cycle or the lunar cycle. And then we have seasonal cycles that are um, changing in response to light over the course of the year. But what I'm gonna be talking about primarily today is circadian rhythms, which are biological processes that are um, occurring over the course of about 24 hours or a single day. And uh, humans have circadian rhythms. So if you think about how your behavior changes in the course of the day, we have uh, the, the kinds of things that you're doing during wakefulness are very different from the things that you're doing during sleep or during the night. And this manifests itself in just about every physiological system in your body with, um, with that shows circadian rhythm. So it's things like changes in energy and motivation, metabolism, growth and immunity, all of these things underserve these differences in behaviors and, and physiological functions that humans um, go through as a, over the course of a 24 hour cycle. But of course we live in a world that's no longer really linked to the daylight cycle in, 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 from natural changes in sunlight. We are a, a 24 hour society that uh, has developed artificial lighting and travels around the world and uh, manipulates our environment in very profound ways. And so desynchronization of circadian rhythms is recognized now as a major problem for health. Um, and these can be things in, involve things like light at night or, or eating meals in the middle of the night or shift work, people who are working in the middle of the night, 
uh, poorly lit work environments like like this office. You know, I, I work in San Diego, but my office looks more like that. <laughs> Long distance travel or or social jet lag, where um, the work schedule or the uh, the life schedule of somebody does not match up well with their internal biological rhythm. And then some medications and seasonal changes and daylight savings time changes and things like this can all impose um, changes on our timing and our circadian rhythms that could put some stress on our circadian clocks. On the molecular basis, the circadian clock is, is really encoded within single cells. And um, it's based on a transcriptional translational feedback loop that's based around these two protein dimers, these VMAL and clock proteins, bind to elements in DNA called E-boxes, which cause the transcription of, of clock genes that we uh, include genes like cryptochromes and periods. There are about uh, five or six of these. These are translated in this in, and become proteins that then come back into the nucleus and negatively feedback on their own transcription, causing these negative feedback loops that are uh, oscillate over the course of about a 24 hour day. So this is the biological basis in a clock. Uh, within cells. These, these proteins are post-translationally modified by protein kinases like, like the glycogen synthase kinase 3 and the casein kinases. And these can change the timing of this transcriptional translational feedback loop to adjust the cycles to make them go faster or slower or to modulate the amplitude, to make the amplitudes stronger or weaker. And interestingly, lithium is um, one of the mood stabilizers that we use to treat bipolar disorder. And by acting on GSK3 beta, has direct access to this transcriptional translational feedback loop and can directly change some of the timing patterns um, that we see in cellular clocks. And so another point is that not everything that's transcribed by these female clock dimers is involved in this transcriptional translational feedback loop. Some of these genes are what we would call rhythmic output pathways. So these are genes that are rhythmically expressed but don't necessarily play a central role in the timekeeping mechanism within the clock, but they uh, instead are um, outputs of the clock that are rhythmically expressed. So components of the stress pathways, such as the cortisol pathway, serotonin and dopamine neurotransmitters that are involved in mood and reward, um, uh, energetic processes within mitochondria, inflammatory processes, melatonin, calcium channels, and on and on are all examples of rhythmic outputs that are centrally controlled by the circadian clock. So circadian disruption not only disrupts timing per se, but can involve um, the disruption of really important output pathways that are physiologically regulated by the clock. And the, the main input to the clock is sunlight. So this is coming through a set of specially developed photoreceptors in the, in the retina called intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells that are responsive to light and send light directly to um, pathways within the brain that include the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is the uh, in the hypothalamus and the central pacemaker in the brain, but also parts of the brain that are involved in mood and reward pathways, such as the amygdala and the habenula, that have important connections to um, other parts of the brain. So light response is, is widely distributed through the brain. And it's been estimated that nearly 50% of genes in the body are rhythmic in at least one tissue. And these genes are not randomly distributed. So the majority of disease associated genes seem to oscillate in their circadian manner. And these genes seem to be enriched in rate limiting steps in enzymatic pathways and are uh, seem to be the most critically important types of genes for a particular kind of cell. And so it's been studied and it was found that nearly 50% of the best selling drugs, at least in the United States, target the product of the circadian gene. So circadian rhythms have really profound effects then for health and disease. And in recent years, there's been a lot of work looking at this, the role of circadian rhythms across health and, and cognitive disorders such as dementias, obesity, and diabetes, um, and then psychiatric mood disorders seem to be three areas where there's really the most growth and, and interest. And for the most of my talk, I'm going to be focusing on this last area, psychiatric mood disorders, and specifically focusing in on bipolar disorder. So bipolar disorder is a serious mental illness that affects about one to 5% of the population, depending on where you want to put your cutoff through the spectrum cases. It's defined by um, symptoms of euphoric or irritable mania that last about a week, alternating with periods of depression where um, thoughts of anhedonia and low mood and loss of motivation and sleep disruption um, are, are, are seen as well. 
And some of the most important risks of bipolar disorder are, are increasing risk, risk, rates of suicide and, and um, massive rates of disability. So this is a very severe disorder that really disrupts people's lives. It's been known for, for decades through twin and genetic studies that it's about a 70 to 80 percent genetically caused disease. We don't know exactly what the mechanism is, but it's concordant quite often in, in twins. And more recent studies using genome-wide association studies have identified common genetic variations in SNPs account for about 25% of that total risk. So, so common genetic variants, not necessarily massive chromosomal rearrangements or, or genetic deletions are, are, have an important role in this disorder. And we're learning something about this genetic architecture, but we still don't really fully understand the biological mechanisms. And one of the reasons that these studies are very hard to do is there's a lot of phenotypic heterogeneity within bipolar disorder. There's, there's a, a number of different ways that you can meet the diagnostic criteria for the disease, and, and really no two people have exactly the same two symptoms. The age of onset can be variable, and the response to treatment can be quite variable. And so this really hampers attempts to study these, um, this disorder in a genetic way, where, where really if you have a group of homogenous patients, it makes the, the analysis much simpler. But one of the things that people have been trying to do is look at variability and treatment outcome. As, as a way to parse some of this heterogeneity. So lithium was discovered about 50 years ago. Sorry, this is next slide. Um, lithium was discovered about 50 years ago and, and, and it's thought that lithium responders may have some traits in common that may distinguish them from other kinds of bipolar disorder. And, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a moment. One of the other things that we, we study is circadian disruption in bipolar disorder. So among the diagnostic criteria for bipolar disorder, things like decreased need for sleep, or hyperactivity or sleep disruption during depression are some of the most prominent um, features of the diagnosis. And even during periods of euthymia, that is periods where symptoms are, are relatively mild, we see these disruptions in circadian rhythms. And I've just made a summary slide for you to kind of summarizing some of the main findings that you see in actigraphy studies. These are studies that measure people's movements over the course of the day. You see in a healthy person that there's these high levels of activity during the day, there's this relatively low activity at night that's kind of uniform through the night as people are sleeping, and then awake time, and then a return to normal activity. In the disrupted bipolar disorder patient, you see that these, the mean level of activity during the day is, is decreased. There's persistence of activity into the night, so there's this delayed phase where the, the people who are winding down in the healthy group are, are still active in the bipolar disorder group. There's this fragmentation of activity overnight where people are up and down and over the night, not sleeping necessarily continuously through. And then there's this delayed onset of activity in the morning when, when uh, the healthy group is rising at sunrise, the, the bipolar disorder group is persisting uh, in, in their inactive phase well into the morning. And the, the sort of change that you're seeing from the low activity to the high activity is what we sometimes call the amplitude. And so there's relatively high amplitude rhythms in the healthy group and this diminished amplitude in the, in the bipolar disorder group. And this manifests itself in a number of different ways. So it's, these circadian rhythms interact importantly with these social rhythms. So these are things like when do you have your meal times, when do you socialize with people, when do you exercise and have activity, when do you sleep. And this causes a, a, a reciprocal feedback between circadian rhythms and social rhythms, which are disrupted. And so this is one of the key reasons that people are disabled in bipolar disorders. They have disruptions to their work and social schedules, which also interact importantly with things like reward pathways in the brain that can cause mood symptoms. So some of the genetic studies that have looked at bipolar disorder have started to identify circadian clock genes among the risk factors that are genetically encoded for, for the disease. Um, this is a, a summary slide from the uh, most recent PGC analysis that looked at, I, I think it's now 50,000 patients with bipolar disorder and, and hundreds of thousands of controls. And they've identified greater than 50 genome-wide associated loci. And I'm not going to say that the majority of them are involved in the circadian clock, but, but a couple of them are. So this one, Arntel, which encodes the clock protein female that I showed you in a previous slide, is, is right there on the edge of genome-wide statistical significance for being associated with bipolar disorder. And if you zoom out just a little bit and, and go into this light entrainment pathway that I talked about a moment ago, you can see that there seems to be an enrichment of these bipolar disorder associated genes in the circadian entrainment pathways as well, too affecting things like calcium channels, glutamate receptors, and intracellular signaling enzymes that are important for conveying light information from the retina into the brain, and then um, upregulating circadian clock genes like, like PER1 
And so shifting gears for a moment back to lithium, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the mechanism of how lithium works. Lithium is an element. It's, um, there's, it's nobody made this drug. <laughs> it was naturally discovered kind of by parsimony about 50 years ago by um, Dr. Cade in Australia. Lithium is a, affects second messenger pathways, um, primarily glycogen synthase kinase beta, but also the IP3 pathway and others. And it's thought to work by promoting neurotropism in neurons. So um, it, it turns on growth factors like brain-derived neurotrophic factors, seems to in increase synaptic density and can protect neurons against stressful stimuli like, like glutamate toxicity or oxidative stress. And this is just an example slide from um, a, a mouse study that was done about 10 years ago showing how um, the, the dendritic density uh, is, is increased by lithium. So you can, this green marker here is, mar is marking dendrites in a mouse neuron before lithium treatment. And then after lithium treatment, you can see that the number of dendritic um, projections has increased considerably by, as a, on account of lithium treatment. And um, we think that maybe lithium response is an interesting way to parse some of the heterogeneity within bipolar disorder. So we've known through, through family studies that lithium response seems to breed true within families. So um, a parent with bipolar disorder who is responsive to lithium, um, should, should their children have bipolar disorder as well too, odds are good that the child will also be responsive to lithium. And the converse is true as well too. So a poorly responsive parent is likely to give birth to a poorly responsive child. There are also some indications that there are stable predictive phenotypic markers that we see in, in lithium response patients. So for example, um, episodes that usually start with euphoric mania and then turn into depression tend to be more lithium responsive than episodes that follow the opposite course with depression followed by euphoria. And in more recent studies that I don't really have time to go into today, there are now some preliminary data from GWAS studies that, um, of, of markers that predict lithium responsive patients from and can distinguish them from lithium non-responsive patients. So all of this tells us that maybe um, there's some heterogeneity that can be um, simplified by focusing on lithium responsive patients. And in some of our cell culture studies, we found that lithium also has effects on circadian rhythms. So this is a, a mouse neuron that's been transfected with a PER2 luciferase reporter. And we've treated the cell either with standard vehicle or, or lithium. And you can see that the, in the red line is the lithium trace. And you can see that the amplitude of the rhythm is increased and, and the period is lengthened. And so that tells us that um, probably by acting through GSK3 beta, lithium has important effects on rhythms. But what we don't yet know is if uh, you can use this effect on circadian rhythms to distinguish lithium responders from non-responders. And so in collaboration with several of my colleagues from um, UCSD and other centers around the United States, we conducted a two-year trial a few years ago called the Pharmacogenetics of Bipolar Disorder Trial or the PGBD trial. This had 11 sites and um, we followed around 400 patients with bipolar disorder who were transitioned from whatever mood stabilizer treatment they were presently on um, over to lithium monotherapy and then followed for as long as two years. And we identified lithium responders and non-responders. And a subset of that group, about 60 of them, gave us skin cell biopsies that we were then able to use for um, cell culture studies, either in fibroblasts or later on in iPSC neurons that I'll tell you about in a moment. And this, this group broke down roughly into about 44 responders and 15 non-responders. There was some imbalance in the group because we didn't know beforehand um, who, who was going to come out to be a responder or a non-responder. And so we got everybody's biopsies at the beginning of the study. And this is just sort of how it played out. But I would say that um, uh, there was some, uh, you know, bias in the study as well too. I think we, we tried to find people who were already doing well on lithium to participate in the study. And so a, a lot of our study um, were lithium responders compared to the non-responder group. And then we were able to ask several different questions of this study. So we were asking um, primarily do differences in cellular circadian rhythms predict therapeutic response to lithium. And we did this in a large cohort of about 60 fibroblasts and then a smaller cohort of about six bipolar disorder patients and, and a handful of controls that we were able to use for stem cell derived neuron experiments. And so just in sort of a, a behavioral characterization of the study, we found that morningness or, or chronotype uh, it, reported by the patient at the beginning of the study actually did predict lithium response. So um, the patients who are morning people who, who like to wake up early in the day and, and feel bright and ready to go at early in the morning 
seems to have a higher rate of response than the evening types, the, the, the night owls, who um, had lower rates of response. And so that was a good indication that we were on the right track. And the, the morning this patients were also had um, fewer symptoms of depression, fewer symptoms of mania, and were less likely to report a suicide attempt at the beginning of the study. To do our cellular studies, we uh, I told you a little bit about this already, but just in more detail, we, we would get a skin biopsy from them and grow out fibroblast cultures. Then we would use an engineered lentivirus that delivers the PER2 luciferase reporter. So, so PER2 is one of the circadian clock genes and it's attached to uh, the firefly luciferase gene, which causes the cell to glow in the dark. And then when the cell is infected with this lentivirus, the, um, the cell glows on and off with the circadian rhythm of, of the host cell. And that's shown here with two different time points. You can see a plate of cells at the minimum time of expression and, and about 12 hours later, we have peak expression. And you can actually see that there's changes in the glowing over the course of the day. And by doing this all within an incubator, we can measure these live cells over the course of about five to seven days and measure the on-off characteristics of these cells, which allows us to calculate um, various dimensions of the circadian rhythm, including the period or, or the time between cycles and the, the amplitude, which is the, basically the strength of the rhythm and the phase, which is the starting point of the rhythm, whether the rhythm is starting on time or a little bit late. And I'm gonna just summarize about five years worth of work from the fibroblasts here for you in, in one slide. So um, it's a busy slide, but um, I'll, I'll walk you through it. In, in general, we found that the responders had short circadian periods relative to the non-responders, you know, about, an, about a half an hour difference on average. And we found that these, um, there were also changes in amplitude in bipolar disorder compared to controls. And that we seemed, these, these changes in amplitude seem to be accentuated by conditions that entrained the clock. So if we put the cells onto a temperature cycle if, that were, where the temperature would vary by two degrees every 12 hours, this would sort of model what you might see in a light dark um, situation in, in a human being. And we found that the amplitude differences were even more pronounced under these entrained conditions. And by doing some um, pharmacology and genetic analysis, we found that the calcium channel um, CACNEC1C, which is also a bipolar disorder risk factor, and the ERK signaling pathway seem to be responsible for some of this amplitude modulation. But of course, doing studies of bipolar disorder in fibroblasts have some inherent limitations. So um, these cells don't express neurotransmitters or uh, receptors such as glutamate or dopamine receptors that are thought to be some of the more important pathways regulating uh, bipolar disorder. The cells don't form synapses with each other. And so they're really isolated in culture and don't have sort of networks that are maybe important for um, brain functions and especially circadian rhythms and other parts of the brain. And if you're trying to think down the road for how you might use this as a drug development tool or a diagnostic tool, they lack a lot of the molecular targets that you would think about um, going after as a potential therapeutic target. And so um, despite the success of this model, we were interested to see if we could develop it and, and take it even further. And so we um, made use of a technique that um, has, has been becoming more and more common in, the, in recent years, which is to use stem cell technology to reprogram the fibroblasts into a pluripotent uh, stem cells, which can then be redifferentiated along a neuronal developmental pathway, first to neuronal precursor cells and then fully differentiated neurons. And this is done, done in, in, in a way that is, um, we, we start with the, the fibroblast cultures that we take from biopsy. We use transient expression of the Yamanaka transcription factors, which are a, a series of four factors that can um, reprogram um, differentiated cells back into stem cells, and then use a mix of um, growth factors and differentiation factors to, to reprogram the neurons into, or, or sorry, the, the stem cells into neurons. And we were able to do this for three controls, two lithium responders and three lithium non-responders. And this is sort of a characterization of the process. So in this top row is just showing the, the stem cell process itself. We, we use an embryoid body protocol which develops these neural rosettes, neural progenitor cells, and then ultimately neurons. And then um, showing you about five of our subjects that we've characterized for various markers of uh, first pluripotency at the stem cell stage, then some of the um, neural progenitor cell markers here, um, beta tubulin staining here, which is a neuron specific marker, and then co-expression of beta tubulin with the glutamate, glutamate uh, vesicular transporter, indicating that these neurons are predominantly um, excitatory in nature. And you could think of them as sort of being a, a model of, of 
frontocortical neurons that have um, sort of excitatory phenotypes. And so using the same HER2 luck method that I showed you before in the fibroblasts, we um, uh, studied rhythms in these, in these um, neurons from, from patients and responders and non-responders. And you can see in the control neurons, we found these really nice rhythms that, that damped out over about five days and can measure the parameters like amplitude and period in these. The lithium responders did okay. They had pretty nice rhythms as well, but the lithium non-responders had very poor rhythms. Their amplitude was very, very low. And where we could find rhythmic neurons, they tended to be uh, a longer period. And so when we measure this, we can see here that the, the amplitude in the non-responder is only about half of what we saw in the controls and the responders. And we, we replicated this finding before from period length, showing that the lithium non-responders had a longer period compared to the lithium non-responders. And then on account of the low amplitude, we see that the damping constant is much faster in the lithium non-responders compared to the other two groups. We also did some studies that um, had, we had never done before, um, looking at single cells. So um, if you uh, put the cell cultures into a, a microscope, that we have in our lab, we can actually measure the circadian rhythms in individual neurons, which lets us do some additional analyses that we couldn't previously do in whole cultures of cells. So we can actually look at the um, phase distributions of cells and see if they're coordinated and, and their rhythms are, are, are working together. And we can actually calculate the proportion of total rhythmicity in the, in the neurons that we've grown. And that turned out, both, both analyses turned out to be informative. So um, this is some just looking at the percent of rhythms in the culture, we found that at the NPC stage, um, there was a trend towards less rhythms in the uh, lithium non-responders, but this difference was not statistically significant. So about a quarter of the NPCs and controls and responders were rhythmic, and then uh, a little bit less than that in the non-responders. But as the neurons differentiated, go from NPCs to neurons, we can see that there's a greater proportion of rhythmic cells in the controls. Whereas this process seems to be arrested somehow in, in both bipolar disorder groups and, and the, date, the difference in the proportion of rhythmic neurons became significant at the neuron level. And then when we look at the phase representation of these neurons, we, can find, we found that the controls were largely phase synchronized. You can see that there are very few neurons that are peaking in their expression in this part of the 24 hour cycle and the majority of them are peaking in, the, in this portion of the day. And this was a statistically significant alignment. Whereas if you compare that to either of the bipolar disorder groups, you can see that uh, these are more randomly distributed around the 24 hour cycle. And you can also see that there are very few uh, rhythmic non-responders to begin with. So what, what rhythmic cells we did find were randomly distributed. And, and while there are more rhythmic cells in the lithium responders, they seem randomly oriented across the day. And that was another statistically significant difference. So we were next interested in, in what part of this transcriptional translational feedback loop could be most affected in the bipolar disorder cells and might we be able to figure out um, some mechanism for these changes in, in rhythms. And um, we did a PCR experiment just on a number of the components of the, the clock pathway. I'm, I'm not showing you everything that we did, but um, the most impressive one was in PER2, which is one of the negative feedback regulators in the transcriptional translational feedback loop. And both lithium responders and non-responders had higher gene expression for PER2 compared to the controls, which are shown here in black. We found relatively modest changes in the other genes that we looked at and, and virtually nothing in the, in the positive limb of the loop and, and only a little bit in the negative limb. So we've, we've concluded here that it's predominantly the negative limb of the transcriptional translational feedback loop that is affected in, in primarily PER2. And so we followed up with PER2 expression looking at the, at the protein level and did some immunostaining of our neurons for PER2. And we found, again, that the responders and non-responders showed more uh, PER2 expression compared to the controls, but the, the difference was even most pronounced in the lithium non-responders. And so that gives us a model of what we think might be happening here, whereas we have this transcriptional translational feedback loop in healthy cells that causes this nice healthy os oscillation in, in gene expression with, with that's a high amplitude rhythm with phase alignment and a roughly 24 hour period. But we think that by overexpressing this PER gene in the bipolar disorder cells, and particularly the non-responders, that this negative feedback loop becomes overdeveloped and, and actually imposes a, a downward pressure on the amplitude of the rhythm, causing um, desynchrony and also longer period in, in the bipolar disorder cells, and in, particularly in the lithium non-responders. <laughs> 
And so I'm going to shift gears here for a little bit. And, and I think at this point, we, we decided that we were pretty confident that we had identified some aspect of lithium non-response that involves the circadian clock, but it doesn't necessarily tell you why lithium non-responders are non-responsive. What does it actually mean that the circadian rhythm is, is disrupted? I mean, and how does that translate into something that you might be able to measure in the brain? And so I was thinking a lot about this kind of work that's been done in the MRI field, where people have, in, in really nice studies with over 2,000 patients and 4,000 controls, have identified these gray matter differences in the bipolar brain versus controls predominantly in the frontal cortex, but also in regions of the, of the temporal lobe and, and other places throughout the brain where there, there seems to be gray matter loss associated with bipolar disorder. And if you study only the, the patients who are with bipolar disorder who are on lithium versus those who are not on lithium, you actually see that there's gray matter sparing on account of the lithium exposure. So this is a, a, a follow-up of this study with 700 patients on lithium and about 892 not taking lithium. And these regions in blue are regions of cortex that seem to be spared in the lithium group compared to the untreated group. So, so one feature of lithium is that it's neuroprotective and it's preserving gray matter volume in bipolar disorder patients. And so it's a, a few people have looked at this in um, clinical trials to see if this gray matter volume is a, is a marker of lithium response or non-response. And I'll just say that it's unclear. It, no one has really been definitive about that. There are studies going both ways. But we wanted to look at this at the cellular level and see if we could develop a model of gray matter loss in cell culture. And so the um, one hypothesis is that these circadian rhythms may relate to neuroprotection and gray matter loss through some of these rhythmic output pathways that I told you about before, like things like stress or metabolism or inflammation. But then the other alternative is that there may be overlap between these pathways and some of the genes that are involved in the circadian clock may also have a role in regulating apoptosis. And this is supported by some of the cancer literature that shows that these, the PER genes that are coming out of this transcriptional translational feedback loop actually have protein interactions with players in the cell cycle that are involved in regulating uh, the response to um, chemotherapeutic agents in cancer or, or involved in things like cell differentiation and cell cycle and apoptosis in, in other contexts. And it seems like there's, depending on the, the state of the circadian clock, it seems like these um, links can be different. So in desynchronized cells where there's the, the circadian rhythm is, is randomly distributed in each cell, there actually seems to be some phase locking where the circadian clock follows very closely with the cell cycle. But if you do something to the cell cultures, like give them a dexamethasone shock or a, a serum shock that entrains the circadian clock, uh, the, the phase of cells, then you see some autonomy where the circadian clock starts to behave um, on its own and, and distinguishes itself from the cell cycle and the phase like the, the phase locking becomes more variable. And so we wanted to look at this process in lithium responders and non-responders. And so in a small group of uh, fibroblast cells, we just measured gene expression at a single time point for several of the clock genes and several of the cell cycle genes. And we found in the whole population that there was good correlation between some of these um, gene expression profiles uh, that cut across members of the apoptosis and circadian clock pathway. But when we broke this apart by um, lithium response, we found that the connection was almost entirely coming from the lithium non-responder cells. The, this, the correlations seem to be much stronger than the lithium non-responders compared to the responders, which is consistent with this idea that a desynchronized circadian clock is more correlated with the cell cycle than, than a strongly synchronized clock, which seems to be able to operate more autonomously. And so we next wanted to see if we could use this to, to find a difference in apoptosis activity among the, the fibroblasts. So we developed a, a method to treat fibroblasts with a drug called starosporine, which induces apoptosis in, in cell cultures, you know, quite broadly. And um, we, it, through a caspase independent path, or caspase dependent pathway. So um, in this assay, when you see caspase activity going up, it's a precursor of apoptosis. And then uh, you can measure the cells a, a few hours later or, or a day later, and you can see that there's a corresponding drop in viability. And so this just proves that the assay works quite nicely. We see this bump in caspase activity on account of starosporine treatment. We see a drop in viability, and we see that lithium on its own has no real effect on either caspase or viability. But then you can sort of calculate the effect of lithium, the, the protective effect of lithium when starosporine and lithium are given together. And um, in this case, we can see that in the bipolar cells, uh, lithium treatment is decreasing the caspase activity, whereas it has no significant effect against the controls. 
And in both controls and in bipolar disorder patient cells, there's some increase in viability on account of the lithium, but the increase in viability is even greater in the bipolar cells compared to the controls. But interestingly, it doesn't seem to distinguish between lithium responders and non-responders. So this is a group effect that we see in bipolar disorder, but not necessarily a pharmacogenetic effect that is distinguishing treatment response. We um, then wanted to see if we could identify individual variants in the circadian clock that may be um, affecting the response of the cells to this apoptosis stimulus. So we went to the literature and pulled out some common genetic variant SNPs that are, these are things that are occurring in the population anywhere from about 11% to over 30% of the population that have been identified through other GWAS studies as having some kind of interest to either a psychiatric or a circadian rhythm type phenotype. And we um, measured the sensitivity to apoptosis by starosporine by genotype. And we found that some of the circadian clock genes indeed seem to show some differences. So this, this is looking at the percent viability by per one genotype. And we find that these, uh, this, the number of cells who had the per one genotype here, the rare variant, seemed to be more resilient to starosporine, whereas uh, a similar variant in the per three genotype um, seemed to cause greater vulnerability to apoptosis. And these, uh, we confirmed that these SNPs are, are functionally meaningful. So um, if we do gene expression for PER1, we find that the, the GG allele that's, that's greater, um, more viable here, also is associated with less expression. And in our PER2 luck assay, we find that this uh, CC allele here that's associated with greater vulnerability seems to be associated also with lower amplitude. So this is, this is some preliminary evidence that maybe individual variation in the clock genes could affect the sensitivity to apoptosis. But we, we took this to an animal system to test this more carefully, where we, we can actually manipulate the expression of these genes and then study um, uh, sensitivity to apoptosis. And so we knocked down PER1 in, in mouse fibroblasts, and we found that uh, knocking down the gene even by itself seems to cause an increase in viability and, and increases the number of cells. And in the starosporine model, that effect is recapitulated. So knocking down PER1 seems to increase the viability of cells after treatment with starosporine. And just like we found with the genetic association study, we found the opposite effect by PER3 knockdown. So PER3 knockdown by itself seems to cause a little bit of loss of cells and heightens the loss of cells that we see in the presence of starosporine. And we also verified that these um, knockdown procedures have important effects on circadian rhythms. So they, they um, in the case of PER1, we see a decrease in amplitude and a shortening of period which is, is really nicely evident on this rhythm trace that we found from the mouse fibroblasts. And similar to what we found with the apoptosis assay, we found opposite effects on rhythms with PER3 knockdown. So we found a, a mild increase in amplitude and, and no real effect on period, but you can see again, this increase in amplitude is, is demonstrated in the rhythm trace here. And so to just briefly summarize the studies that we found from, from fibroblasts, we, we found that there's distinct organization of this clock apoptosis gene network in bipolar disorder, and that we found that the bipolar disorder cells seem to be more receptive to lithium protection, and that individual genetic variation um, may be associated with differences in apoptosis in, in bipolar disorder cells. It, it seems that this effect is more of a bipolar disorder biomarker and not a pharmacogenetic marker in that we didn't see real differences between uh, responders and non-responders, but it does su support the idea that there could be circadian involvement in the cell death pathways, and that there could be some link from circadian disruption to, um, to loss of neurons in, in vivo. Um, but again, we have this limitation that we're limited phase validity using fibroblasts to model a CNS disorder. And, and what we would really want to do here is study neurons. And so in, in this last set of slides, I'm going to show you some of the experiments that we've done now in, in um, iPSC-derived neural progenitor cells using the same assay. So this is just to convince you that the starosporine assay does indeed cause apoptosis in the NPCs. We, we see this nice increase in caspase activity um, after starosporine treatment, and we see this time-dependent drop in viability that was similar to what we saw with fibroblasts. And lithium on its own has very little effect on either caspase activity or viability. But when we calculate the difference of the effect of lithium um, on, on caspase activity during combined treatment of cells, we, we see that um, caspase activity is broadly going down with, with the effect of lithium and that viability is broadly going up with um, lithium. In, in this particular experiment, we didn't have enough of a sample to really identify a difference between the controls and the bipolar. So we can conclude that lithium is neuroprotective here, but we can't really conclude that there's a difference yet between um, the controls of the patients. 
And this is just some example data showing um, on a whole culture what the effects might look like. This is a vehicle treated cell culture. And you can see the, the loss of cells with starosporine and the, the recovery of some of the cells when you add lithium back to the, to the treatment. But then we, we wanted to see if we could identify in, um, uh, some of the causal effects of manipulating clock gene expression on apoptosis. And we, we focused in on PER1. This is one of the ones that we found in the fibroblast experiment had genetic association with viability. And, um, and we found in preliminary experiments that this was the one that really responded nicely to starosporine. And so when we treat the cells with starosporine, um, we found that starosporine broadly increases gene expression for PER1 in all of the groups, but it really it increases expression in the lithium responders. I'm sorry, I, I lost my key here. So the green are the responders and the reds are the non-responders and the grays are the controls. So PER1 expression is going up much higher in, in response to starosporine in the responders compared to the other two groups. And then when we use an siRNA strategy to knock down gene expression, we find that um, knocking down PER1 generally decreases viability of all of the groups, but it really decreases viability, particularly in the lithium non-responders. So it decreases viability by about twice as much. So this says that the, um, the lithium responders and non-responders are relying on PER1 in, in different ways to um, respond to cellular stress that causes apoptosis, and that the loss of PER1 seems to be particularly um, dangerous for, for lithium non-responders. And then we followed up this experiment looking at um, protein um, for PER1 immunostaining in, in, lithium, non, in lithium responder and non-responder neural progenitor cells. And because we're able to do this using a microscope, we can partition out the, cy the cytoplasmic versus the nuclear protein, which could be important because I told you before that there's um, uh, in this negative feedback loop in the, in the circadian clock, the protein accumulates in the cytosol before um, transposing back into the nucleus and, and having the, the final action in the nucleus to, to cause um, to, to close the loop of the negative feedback loop. So it's both the compartmentalization and the absolute expression levels could be important. And in the cytoplasm, we found to begin with that, that the PER1 protein was much higher at baseline in the lithium non-responders compared to the other two groups. We found that starosporine increased cytoplasmic protein broadly across all three groups, but only um, in the lithium non-responders did lithium decrease this expression. When we shift to the nucleus, we found again that the lithium non-responders seem to be expressing per one at higher levels than either the other two groups. We find that, that lithium and co-treatment with starosporine seems to be shuttling the per one protein back into the nucleus in a way that doesn't seem to be happening in the lithium non-responders. And so this leads us to some interesting conclusions that, that um, per one protein seems to be higher both in the cytosol and in the nucleus in the non-responders. And that um, Starosporine, or, or let's say cellular stress, turns on per one expression sort of as a general um, response to, to this apoptosis stimulus. And that there may be differences in the cytosolic versus nuclear compartmentalization between lithium responders and non responders that could point to some mechanism of how lithium is, is affecting um, the per one protein. And so this is a complicated data set. So I'm going to try to summarize it one more way for you just to kind of give you an overall conclusion here. So um, in the NPCs, we're not seeing a difference in apoptosis, but we're cautious about drawing conclusions from this just based on the small sample size. We, we can conclude that maybe PER1 is a marker of neuroprogenitor cell stress, and that we see um, higher rates of increased PER1 and, um, and greater impact on PER1 knockdown in the lithium non-responders. So that could indicate that the response of PER1 to um, cellular stress could be a, an important marker of, of lithium response. And that loss of nuclear PER1 protein may implicate um, protein transport as, as some important mechanism in lithium. And so to kind of finish up here, I think I'm reminded of the allegory of the elephant where you have five different people all describing um, one uniform thing, but, but depending on where they're sitting or where they're touching, they're getting a different conclusion of what this might be. And I, I think this is similar to what we're seeing with uh, descriptions of, of lithium response. We have a lot of different people all studying different aspects of it that are all probably right, but we're still kind of waiting for a, a unifying concept to pull together what lithium response might look like at the cellular level. And so some ideas for future interactions are we're, we're working on developing additional kinds of neurons. I mean, so far we've done most of our neuron work in glutamatergic neurons that would be a good model for the frontal cortex, but 
other groups and other um, parts of the brain are working on um, GABA, dopamine, and serotonin as other interesting populations of neurons that are worthy of study. We, we really want to do some additional work on identifying the circadian mechanisms that may be involved in neuronal survival and the neural protection. And of course, um, some of the shortcomings are, are of a small sample size are really impeding our, our ability to um, distinguish some of these groups. So we're working on increasing our sample size and, and seeing if we can get more statistically robust findings. And I think with that, I'd just like to thank all of the members of my lab who've done much of this work and assisted me with the project over the years and, and some of the funders, including the, the Pharmacogenetics Consortium, the Conlogen Consortium, and the, the, the VA who, who pays for a lot of the work. And then these are the members of my lab who've done a lot of the work, including Hamanchu Mishra, who's a former postdoc in my lab, who is now um, recently graduated and is on the job market. So if you're looking to hire somebody who's really good at this kind of stuff, uh, let me know and I'll put you in touch with them, aren't you? And I think with that, I'm, I'm happy to turn it over for questions. 